everybody to episode two of Critical Eyes podcast, High Impact Leadership. Um, in these episodes, we'll be looking at what it means to be a highly effective leader in today's climate um, and inviting a number of high profile chairs and non-executives onto the podcast to share their views. Um, this week, I'm delighted to welcome Sally Bridgeland, Chair of Impacts Asset Management and a board mentor at Critical Eye. Welcome, Sally. Thank you very much. And joining Sally, uh, we have Matthew Blagg, CEO at Critical Eye. Afternoon, Mark. Afternoon. Afternoon, Sally. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for, for joining me. Um, I think, I mean, the topic of high impact leadership is hugely relevant, I think, at the moment, given the number of headwinds that um, senior leadership teams and boards are facing. And we're going to run through, um, from your perspectives, what, what, what that looks like. Um, I think if we, we start with on that sort of macro macro picture, um, what is your take on recent events and the subsequent market volatility that we're seeing? Um, and I, I guess, you know, what, what are the implications for, for businesses and senior leadership teams? Um, Sally, could I put that to you first? Certainly. So I think um, my message would be volatility is here to stay. Um, both in local and global politics. There's no reason to assume that we're going to suddenly sail out into calm waters, um, which means that um, the importance of being an impactful leader rather than just a leader and getting the right balance in the message to the workforce and the management team around making sure the business has the right resilience uh, and avoids the bumps, but also makes the most of any opportunities that this unusual situation presents to us. It, it makes it quite a, it's a difficult balancing act um, to make sure that you have both sides of that particular coin. Um, so very important that leaders are clear in those mes messages. And I think the transition also to a from a global economy to much more locally focused uh, economies uh, and the transition to a sustainable economy. There's all kinds of issues and contradictions within that that leaders will have to tackle. OK, so, so managing through the uncertainty. I mean, from, from your perspective, uh, I, I guess any reasonable board and senior leadership team, they, they, there won't be a, a hankering back to things to return to normal. There'll be an understanding that this is it, isn't it? This is this is normal, don't, don't, don't you think? Is that, is that kind of yeah, where uh, we are at, uh, at the moment? Well, I think the, um, it, you know, we always talk about non-executives and chairs being critical friends and having that top-down perspective, that external perspective. And I think that's just, that's more important than ever because, there, there will certainly be moments when there'll be chief executives thinking, well, why me? Why did this happen? <laughs> where I was, you know, when I was at the top, the other guys uh, and gals in the past have had it so easy. Uh, and that's when the, the, the sort of friendly bit of the critical friend is, has to be there to encourage and say, yeah, you're up to this. Let's go for this. Um, take risks, invest in resources, whatever the opportunities are. Um, but also that critical bit is just making sure they don't take the eye off the ball um, and strengthen the infrastructure, decide what core is to the business and make sure that that is, is resilient uh, and just help them get that sort of longer term clarity, sort of where is the North Star in all of this, this these ups and downs. Okay. Okay. So still looking at where the opportunities are for growth, what's going to be the plan to really deliver. Yeah, that, that. that strategic direction and, and where do we believe as an organization um the opportunities are for us in probably a five-year time horizon, uh, when you can kind of look beyond the media ups and downs. Um, because those are the kinds of planning horizons that people are having to adopt for things like their their attitude towards net zero and it will be yeah it's unusual if they're they're not thinking about the same time frames for the whole business because it that needs to reflect their path on the on sustainability needs to uh reflect that time horizon as well 
Okay, I, I think there uh, maybe it's something to come on to, but I think there's an interesting question there about whether the, the CEOs are really up to that and whether they're right to take the company onto onto that journey, or or maybe a, a change is required. Um, Matthew, from, from your perspective, what's your what's your view on this? I agree with um, everything um, Sally said. I think that the um, that the, there is a, um, a huge amount of ambiguity. It's a very complex world. There isn't necessarily short term gains. There is definitely long term wins. Um, I think there is a danger of people and organisations, whether it's executive or non executive, becoming re reactive. And I think you you've got to have a long term focus. I think focusing on core and customer. Um, are of paramount importance. And um, I think that, um, that keeping calm, being consistent is really important um, in this um, environment. And I completely agree about the global local piece. I mean, I, I think wherever you are in the world, it's going to be a tricky mix of yeah. uh, scenarios. There isn't, there isn't a free pass for anyone on this one. And in that sense, there's no one coming over the hill to save you. So um, you've got to lead your way out of it. And I think it does put real emphasis on leadership and management capability through an organization. Um, and so it's going to be very much exposing the competencies and skills that you've got around the table. Yeah, absolutely. The point around being reactive, what, what, what does that mean? What, what's, what, what's an example of being too, too reactive in the current environment? Well, I think, I think reactive, not being reactive at the moment is difficult because especially as we're in a world where data flows fast, and so there's a danger that you get bits of data and build a case scenario on it. And in a lot of ways, there's a lot of pressure to do that. And I think sometimes in these scenarios, you've got to, you've got to try and be calm and let, let things even out. Um, and I think that that's the, the real bit is, is to make sure that you really have have the right inputs before you make fundamental decisions and uh, buy yourself time to, to get, get the information. So I think also the, the, um, there's a danger of sort of needing too much information to make a decision. I think sometimes you've got to go on instinct. And again, those, those boards and leadership teams that have instinct, which is built up through lots of different feeding points that, that support decision making, I think I'm, I'm going to be bold and brave on that. I think we'll outperform. Sally, do you agree? Yeah, and I think the the role of the non executives is is to help with that bravery um, when when confidence might be faltering, but also maybe to hold it back if it's if the instincts might not be that strong, and you don't have to look very far um, to um, have some examples of leaders in UK politics whose instincts may not have been. Um, as good as we would have liked um, and that really to me the big message from there is um, take advice it's not just about I think the new style of leadership is around having the right team around you rather than about the big I am the the heroic leader of the past um, so it which is fantastic in terms of really bringing inclusion to life uh, and making sure you've got those right voices around the table. Uh, and reactive is fine. I mean, what we're really talking about is having a long-term clear direction, but shorter term agility around that and marshalling your resources, being clear how you're spending your money for people, for advisors, for systems, um, to balance between the right amount of focusing on that future, but also being able to to move and be reactive and to take opportunities as well as be resilient against those shocks. Um, so I think the, the sort of uh, the, the point you raised earlier about our CEOs um, up to it and up for it, um, they will need a different kind of focus on, on this purpose, vision, culture and inclusion to help to delegate better and to focus their teams and make sure that the missions are clear. Uh, and I think it's it's timely the fact that we're now more having more face to face um, management and uh, team working because that is so important in getting getting the message across in the right kind of way. Okay. Okay. And I suppose if you don't have that that skill set, that EQ, then you're going to be more exposed as a leader and you, you won't 
have people following you on the journey that the business needs needs to go on. Um, Matthew, in, in this environment, do you, do you see more CEOs maybe not ready for this sort of next stage of the journey that we're that we're talking about? Well, I've been sort of I've been a CEO myself for about thirty years. I don't think there's any ever a time when you're you're ready. But but what I do think is that these environments require you either have a lot of experience or, or to get experience quickly. And I think that comes back to the right inputs and the right support around you and and, um, and to make sure that, that um, you do have an inclusive um, culture because it will be brutally exposing. And what we're already seeing across Critical Eye, the optics of leadership are under greater scrutiny and really understanding the societal impacts and the implications of your decisions through your stakeholder base, I think that pressure on that is going to be huge. And I think that's something that often for um, CEOs who are early on tenure or executives who are first in that real hot, hot environment, I think that can be quite difficult. And I think that's where the board plays a huge role. I think that support of, of providing that, that wider context and, um, and understanding is, is more important than ever um, today. Okay. Okay. Sally, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think the key word is resilience and actually resilience through that collective understanding. Um, I, I think the, the challenge will be for those leaders who are used to managing the business by numbers, um, by just thinking about this year's performance and managing to budget. Um, budgets, this is a year when budgets are going to go all over the place. Yeah. Uh, and so having a different way of looking and thinking about success is going to be important. And it is going to be much more collaborative with the board, working together with the board rather than reporting to the board and justifying performance. So there's a different style of, of working with the, the executive and the non-executive. Okay. I mean, that, that kind of brings me on, on to the, the point around, I guess, what does a high impact board look like? Because that's that requires a certain mindset and approach from the chair and non-executive directors because obviously there's duties and responsibilities that that, that they have to to shareholders so uh, maybe if we can go into that a, a, a little bit more how how are the chair and non-executive directors supporting ceos in 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 this environment what what are they, what can they do to help take a bit of the pressure off so i think the most important thing is is kind of i'd describe you know, the, the encouragement for non-executives to challenge the executives has sometimes led, as in politics, and I'm not going to keep banging on about politics, I it's promise. It's difficult at the moment though, isn't it? It is very difficult <laughs> right now, but <laughs> kind of where, where does a politics of opposition fail? It's when you're too busy arguing with each other to actually look forward and develop that, that long-term strategic view. So, uh, and that's really where, um, and I think it's partly been technology, the availability of data, uh, performance metrics, remuneration, definitions, all of that stuff has kind of encouraged us to get very analytical uh, and, and think that we can control things through data. The reality is, is with the amount of volatility and uncertainty over the, the longer term or even the sort of three, five year period. I'm an actuary, so longer term to me is 40, 50 years <laughs> rather than five years, but most people would say long term is five years. Um, what we're trying to do is make sense and have some kind of vision for that future. Uh, and the reality is, is, is that if you have that, you don't actually disagree about much. You, you kind of agree where you want to be going. And the things that become more important are, are things like what do our customers think as, as you know, we were talking about earlier, what do our what do our staff think? What are what are our competitors going to do? What is the political environment out there? And talking about those kinds of scenarios together can be a better way of bringing in that external expertise from those of us who have seen more failures collectively um, than any chief executive to bring that to bear and talk about that together with a shared purpose rather than focusing on yes, you've come up with this recommendation, but we can see why it's wrong, which um, 
Mine's you've had helped. to evolve your style in, in in the boardroom to sort of provide that input and to to give that support where maybe the training um, and background would be to look I, so I think I think it uh, I'm probably singing from my own hymn sheet there in that this is a style that I like yeah. because I don't like beating people up I'm a bit of a don't mm. sit people on the naughty stir give them praise praise is magic and, and encouragement yeah. that's the, the style of parenting and the style of uh, of being a non-exec but I have seen mm. a change uh, in the um, 10 so years that I've been on boards from one style to the other and I can see just how effective it is particularly in uncertain times okay okay Matthew would you would like to come in there well I think often the, the reality of these things are semi-binary when things are all you know got a good board a good chair good it's relatively straightforward and these things happen naturally I think the environments where that's not the case i think the question of how do you how do you create that environment and i think that's more difficult in this landscape because there's more ambiguity so i think as, as a within that you've really got to focus on the chair in terms of driving it forward and if that i think that that can be um you know binary you've got to have a good chair um driving driving that dialogue and i think that that then drives through the non-executives and the executive team and I think it's why you will see more change of, of on, on boards um, through this phase, because I think it will expose skills. And I think that's really important. You've got to have the right balance on it. But it's not it's not easy to get it right if you've not got it naturally on the board that you're on. I think if you've got it, it's quite easy to reinforce that positive environment. I think if you haven't got it, it's not easy. And I think the, the relationship between the chief executive and the chair is absolutely key in all this because if that tone isn't right and they haven't done the right groundwork outside the board meetings it'll be um it's more likely to be a problem and a challenge for the rest of the board um so that's when the senior independent director might need to dive in and uh, smooth things over and help encourage a different kind of behavior but if if as a board you're trying to encourage a culture of inclusion then really that's what this is about. It, it is about being able to argue without taking it personally, create a safe space in the board environment so that, that people can focus on um, the variety of perspectives that they're bringing rather than um, focusing in on agreeing or disagreeing, uh, you know, a very bi binary attitude towards whatever the executive are putting forward. And, and if we talk about that creating a safe space within, within the board environment, what, in your view, what, what would be an example of a discussion whereby topics can be broached in a way where it's not just going to immediately become too too controversial or people are going to be afraid that they're saying the wrong thing, that it's going to seem like there's suddenly a, a, a dramatic shift in direction that hasn't been discussed properly? So what, what, what's your view of like what a safe space looks like for discussion? So I, I think... The, the board papers can set the right or the wrong tone for that kind of discussion. If you come with a board paper with a single recommendation, this is the right answer. We've clearly done loads and loads of work um, and everybody's invested in a particular solution. That can mean that non-executives are wary of the time that has been wasted, the emotional attachment to a particular idea. If it's, if it's fully baked and beyond, it's kind of 12 out of 10 solution. This is perfect, which is, of course, what our educational system prepares us for, that there is a right answer and here's the right answer, voila, kind of thing. Um, that can be difficult. Whereas if the, if the chair can say, what I'd really like the discussion to be at the meeting is of the, the other things that you thought of, the things that you discussed as a management team, that had had merit but were not so good or, or or the risks that you see in your proposal it just kind of opens it up to the purpose of the discussion is not to say that you are right and you know and anything else is wrong because governance isn't about that the governance is about making sure that every under, everybody understands um if this is wrong what the consequences are 
uh, and that then becomes the right answer to the exam question is we're we're testing this this for resilience rather than seeing whether it's right or wrong because that then feeds into well what do we need to look out for where might the skills of the non-executive be useful in building on that idea and even if the executive go ahead and decide to do it exactly as they want to, which they can do, they are the executive after all, yeah. then they're, they're conscious of the different things that they want to re- will need to report back on to, to show to the non-executive how they built on, on the thoughts that they had. Uh, and that's, that's all fine. You're, you're basically changing, uh, you know, a great course that I did many years ago because, you know, I'm a girly SWAT and good at exams. So, right, read the exam question, RTFQ, as it was known, um, it is always the order of the day in exams. The reality in, in board meetings is you change the question. You change the questions you're asking, which is how could, how could this go wrong? Uh, um, what haven't we thought of here? Uh, and if you go into it with that kind of um, gentle, supportive uh, line of inquiry, mm. genuinely um, being interested un- in understanding and finding out uh, what are the things the executives had doubts about uh, and what are the things, uh, what are the risks that we're exposed to, it, it just sets that conversation up quite differently. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, it comes back to the point that that's the culture you want when you're in such a volatile environment where, you know, who knows necessarily what, yeah. what, 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 and, what and you can do it in a, in a sort of disciplined way using scenario testing or really whatever suits the culture of the organization. If it's a very numerical quantitative organization that might help bring that to life, but you're basically saying nobody knows the right answer. Nobody knows what the future is going to be like. So let's explore. Yeah, yeah. Matthew, it's, it's emphasising that need, isn't it, to be sort of open and outward looking? I think very much so. I think it's also allocating time to have open debate. Um, and and I think the strategy, Jay's, I think going back to Sally's point about in-person experience, sort of the element to come together the evening afterwards. Um, and I think that goes beyond just the, the um, CEO and CFO who are probably on the board, but also some of the senior executives and actually having an open dialogue with them outside of the formal points. I think becomes um, really powerful. Obviously, there's a time commitment there and that can create work. But I think when that's done well, it, it does create a more um, open, inclusive culture, which I do think is vital in this market. And certainly I'm seeing in, in board meetings, even if they're not strategy board meetings, is we're spending less time on the things that you don't need to spend time on. You know, there are governance tasks that you have to do. Um, but finding a low maintenance way of and a low time way of on the agenda of dealing with those, you know, writing your questions on yellow stickers on diligent or whatever in advance so that you kind of deal with that stuff and the little, you know, points of understanding. And you have a, a meteor section where you can spend three quarters of an hour, an hour really talking about something that is worth talking about. And again, that's. Um, that's a bit of team working between the the chief executive and the chair to make sure that everybody's expecting the same kind of conversation. Okay, what are some of those meteor topics at the moment? Um. Oh, in the world of finance, inflation, 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 inflation. Infl- well, and uh, you know, a bit of currency and interest rates, depending on pension funds, Thank which of course is my okay. favorite favorite subject. But um, given my heritage, but. Um, but but inflation from so many angles in in terms of what does this mean for how we pay our staff and uh, and how they work and how we resource ourselves and uh, what does it mean for our customers and our products um, as well as what does it mean for our business plan of the future and the shareholder expectations so it's it's like coming at it from all different angles uh, and the more quantitative you are the more you model these things. Uh, the more that uncertainty feeds through into those figures. Okay. Okay. I'll just come on to CFOs. Um, and they, they, do you think that the, the increased pressure on, on CFOs is exposing any gaps in their experience and capabilities? And I guess 
what should we be looking for from from CFOs in in this environment? Matthew, if I put that to you first, and then Sally, I'll come to you. Well, we know historically that a time of um, tighter economic environment means there's there's more need for figures to be produced and reworked, and and um, obviously shareholders store it. Shareholders are on on things tighter, so there's no question that CFOs are under more, micro, more of a microscope. We know that there's burnout potential. I think burnout is a real issue um, through the executive environment um, and through the layers of the organization. So I think the, the, um, there's, there is two elements to the role of the CFO. First of all, I think there's a danger that traditional traits can come out where they, they are cost controlled without driving the growth agenda. And the second thing is that their workload triples and that you don't get the, the time investment in the other areas of their role. And so it, it's, um, it's not an easy environment for the CFO, particularly if you haven't got the experience to push things back um, and be really honest about that, because there's a danger they give that, that they're subservient to the needs and, and they won't succeed in this environment if they are. I think it goes back to my point about understanding what's core and what's non-negotiable, and that means that the CFO needs to understand not just the numbers, but what lies beneath the numbers. So um, including a good understanding of the human resources and the, the staff costs in the business. And uh, So for where example, it, it, it might be more cost effective to have fewer staff, but more highly skilled staff. But there would be quite a, a shift in, in the way that the, the resourcing would be would be done. So it's really about putting the chief in the CFO. It's it's understanding the business uh, and how you can be smart in managing that. And the reality also is 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 the CFO as the um, knowing the levers that can be pressed to um, increase debt. Um, change the financing of the business not just the finances of the business yeah yeah and a good CFA will have that team around them to give them the, the, yeah the, into the detail but but it it's it's not just about the numbers it's what about about what the numbers can can do okay okay Matthew anything you wanted to add there well it's also why you'll see more CFO to CEO mm -hmm. Uh, moves because again if um, from Sally's point was exactly right if you've got that competency then the, to a certain extent there's a bit of a wafer thin gap between the CEO and the CFO in terms of skills and drive and, and so you are seeing boards lean in that direction more that's not a surprise um, it is an outcome of a tighter tighter environment two, two roles come to the surface more uh, obviously finance and operations depending on the, the type of organization you are but you've got to get closer to the business and then um, and um, so you're seeing a, a change of skill requirement in the CEO. Okay. But we touched on it earlier, the, the need for growth and looking at opportunities. So who, who do you think will be the winners and losers, if we can put it in the, those terms, in, in this period of economic uncertainty? Um, how, how do you think it's going to play out? Sally, would you like to go first? Yeah, I suppose I'm in danger of repeating myself, but I think those who are kind of locked in the old way of managing a budget rather than um, thinking about the purpose or vision of the business for the future. Um, those who've had fewer um, failures, <laughs> so we learn from our mistakes. Um, those who are um, less willing to take advice um, uh, and kind of know their own but those who are the, so the winners uh, are those who have got uh, openness, vision, and uh, and understanding, self awareness um, as leaders is, is going to be absolutely vital in uncertainty because there are no right answers. Okay, strategic clarity as as, as well. I mean, you touched on the climate change agenda and the sort of the the opportunities there. I, I mean. That, how challenging is it to hold your course and to give them yeah opinion? i i think it's it's getting that balance right again between holding your course without realizing that the tide is coming in against you uh it, so it's a it's having the the vision in a uh holding the vision in a uh, a light enough way that means that if opportunities arise or there are setbacks that you can you can move around that 
And I think that makes it it genuinely difficult for businesses to to plan their resourcing in the same way as we used to in the past. But equally, post-COVID, there are more options open to, to businesses in how they use resources and how they think about external assistance and expertise. Matthew? Well, I think a tight marketplace you know, is a huge opportunity. And I think that the, there's more change that will come um, from it. I think the, the thus that comes back to um, a, there's an element of luck because if you if you balance sheet and positions in the wrong place as the market shifts, then I think it's pretty binary and you're looking for the right managed exit. And then conversely, I think if you've got the right structure, the right environment, I think there's a massive opportunity. It's timing, like all things in life. You know, my first business was was a wine company, and and um, biggest period in the year is Christmas, and that the best biggest buying point is the summer, and there's a gap between those two things and understanding the gap is going to be probably massively important you know if you go too early if you go too late there was no question we know there's consolidation coming we know there's a focus on core it's just a question of when that plays out and how it plays out and who leads it and so i think that generally those organizations that i think coming back to Sally's point are clear in terms of purpose have alignment through the organization have strong consistent leadership I think have an opportunity and um, and that's the exciting bit and I think it's the exciting bit that is really important to have on every single table because I think there is a danger that you get caught up in it's you know the the, the tighter marketplace and sometimes holding ground is winning okay I mean I, yeah. just as you were speaking there I mean I just sort of running through conversations I've had with execs and Neds. I mean, I, there are a lot of worried faces at the moment. I know I know we want it to be exciting, but you can see that you know, the just long hours, travel, huge questions around cross cost structures. I think it I think it's getting difficult in boardrooms as there's more investor pressure. Now look, it varies by sector. Of course it does. But but what what are, what are the conversations if, if there's a new CEO and they're not that relationship with the the chair isn't quite in the place that it needs to be? What, what do they need to do? Because I think that the whole point of this conversation is that you absolutely have to have the board aligned. What what would be some of the the options? What 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 do they need to do to try and get that that cohesion and that working relationship right? I don't know, Sally, if I could put that to you first. Yeah, I, I think. Um one of the most useful conversations they can have is around um, what they don't know and being open about what they don't know. So if it's a new relationship, either one of them will be new uh, and to go into that with a spirit of um, naivety, uh, not, not worry, uh, I'm a big, big believer that neither worry nor anger do any good in the world and are a bad use of energy because, there's, you know, worrying about something um, doesn't actually change it. Um, just think about what you can do, what you can influence. Yeah. Um, but being open about that uncertainty and um, asking for help is a very powerful thing to do, whether it's a chair or a chief executive. Um, to change the dynamic in the relationship from, you know, the age-old relationship between two alpha males circling around each other, um, you know, that, that we've moved on from that and we, we need to carry on moving on from that, whether they're male or female. Um, it, it, it's so that they can look at something in the future together uh, and look at that um, commonality. Uh, again, I'm a mathematician. I'm drawing a Venn diagram here about things that love Chief Executive believes. We we all we all love Venn diagrams. Um, um, did you see the one? Did you see the one about British people and ants? I have um, not seen that. It's one. one for another day. But it's about it's no, about I feel how, like we like, it should be how we like how we like queuing and taking other people's stuff and that kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, deciding on what you agree about can be really helpful and. My experience as chief executive is 
most of the board meetings can be spent on disagreeing with st about stuff. When you have one-to-one -one conversations with your individual non-executives and members of the board, you realise that actually you agree about 80% of the stuff. So just taking the time to spend a bit more time talking about the stuff you agree on, it's, it's like the, the legendary Irish peace process. You know, can we agree that today it is Wednesday? Um, it, starting with some of the basics, just changes the tone of that conversation that means that having agreed with each other and feeling happy about stuff you can then go on to talk about some of the very important stuff where you need to challenge it and uh, may disagree okay Matthew well I think one of the things is that, I mean leadership isn't a right and um, I think it's one of the, the these environments are quite humbling and I think that's really important. I mean, I think that there is a massive responsibility on the shoulders of leaders. I think sometimes that baggage is quite light and then sometimes it's heavy. And I think we're probably in a time when it's heavy, but that's fine. That's part of the remit. That's why you've paid what you paid. And I think it's important to be honest um, around the table about that and I think that that those leaders that carry that and recognise that that responsibility, I think they'll have more alignment with their stakeholders, and I think that is really important because I don't think you can um, bulldoze your way through this. I think you've you've got to nurture your way through through um, through that, and um, so that for me is is um, incredibly important. I think one of the references you're hearing. The sort of CEOs and leadership teams and CEO needs to be a counsellor. I think there's an element of the non-executives need that. I think everyone needs to have to be a counsellor and to counsel. I think in some ways you've got this sort of element where different people need different support at different points. And I think that, again, those teams that have the ability to pick up and dust down the weaker player, provide the right sucker and support, but actually get them back in the game, I think will do better than those that throw them out and bring in a new one. I suppose one of the challenges is um, is admitting a degree of vulnerability um, for those in highly paid roles of members of the top team. Um, what what role do do we think mentoring can play in supporting executives during during this time? And Sally, if you would like to answer, yeah, that first. I think the the good thing about mentoring is this is about the person. Um, you're you're trying to establish a a comfortable trusting relationship with an individual uh, that allows them to disclose their vulnerabilities. And the I think the most important question for a mentor to ask people is: Have they got the right team around them? Um, have they got? And that helps them by thinking about other people's strengths and weaknesses can quite often help them think about their own and, and what, what complementary skills they need around them. Uh, and this extends, you know, if you're talking to a chief executive or a CFO, it's not just the icing in the organisation, it is that critical marzipan layer, the next layer down. Have you got talent there that provides you with the right kind of resilience in the organisation? Um, and also means that if you're in a, a chief role, you've got people, competent people that you can delegate uh, things to so that you can be the leader, the chief, the strategic thinker that you need to be in the current market environment. So have you got the right team around you? Have you are you making the most of them? Is there anyone that isn't on the program, you know, that isn't up to it or up for it? Um, because some of sometimes that's the most difficult decision. So being the mentor there, you can help them build the confidence and be ready to have the conversations to move people on. Um, those of us who've, who've been chief executives, we've all had to do it. Um, so it, it's not our first time at having to have those difficult conversations. Would you agree, Matthew? I, I would. I also think, and, and again, the, the the environment that we're in requires leaders to not be isolated. And I think that the point around mentoring is also to encourage the CEO or the individual to seek further guidance. So it's not that they're in themselves providing all the answers. I think the element of say, look, if I was you, I might want to benchmark that with someone else. And it might, you know, 
that element of wider reference point encouraging them to do that because i do think that that it's very easy to have narrow feed um as a ceo you know to a certain extent and ironically the larger the organization the narrow that feed is and actually i think the insight from outside of that is probably really more and more important and i think that's where a mentor can give reference points and you can see that the, the executive is becoming more isolated in, in their thinking and challenging them and encourage them um, from their own reference points. Because by its very nature, it is a role that does suck you into being more isolated. I mean, let's be honest here. Leadership by its very nature does is, is, a, is a straight jacket. It does pull you in. And I think that a mentor's job is to try and encourage you to break out of the straight jacket of the role. And I think in this market, that's vital. Do you see that, Sally, from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's tough at the top. It always has been. And I, and I think what's what's been interesting around COVID, around talking about mental health in the workplace, about talking about diversity, some of these, um, I was having a conversation this morning. I was talking, you know, have you got the right support network around you? And I don't just mean at work. I mean at home as well. Uh, you know, in your personal life, in your friendship groups, you know, whatever your family circumstances are, um, there will be pressures and stresses from that. And these things are much more mushed up together than they used to be. They they bleed from one to the other. Uh, and that affects not only mental health and resilience and your ability to make sound decisions, um, but also your just just your general attitude and ability to to cope with with some of these with the ups and downs they will get you down the downs will get you down more uh, and the ups might not get you as up as much as you would have liked if if things are not right in that support network so uh, you know i'd agree with the uh the point that matthew was making around that support being vital okay okay um coming to the end the podcast and I guess so that, that's as, as you've been talking I just like from like Sally from, from your experience maybe from boards you've sat on or Mexico's you've been involved in what what sort of what sort of really if you could condense it stands out for you as high impact leadership what, what does it mean um I think always inclusive because otherwise you're not making the most of that that team but I think the characteristics really need to reflect the priorities of the business. So you've got this, this balance between growth and resilience and constancy. You need that clarity of thought. Um, you need a, a team to be good at delegating, which means having that um, clear strategic vision, but also deciding how you're using your resources and making sure they know what they're there for and what their purpose is. Um, increasingly with the, the current questioning generation and a more fluid workforce, it's less about careers and more about experiences and opportunities and learnings. So motivating people in a different kind of way is important. Um, being good listeners, having trusted people around them um, to keep them on track in the moment uh, uh, and being that to each other on a team yeah. you know being being there they're, they're non-execs in the moment when they don't have a board meeting right around the corner okay Matthew I think generally if you look at it the the, the um key is that the business performs without the leaders being there I mean effectively the point should be that that actually the leaders who are um naturally empowering and creating a culture of operational performance generally you've got you've got a high performing environment that can take advantage of that and i think the challenge in this environment is for leaders to drop down into the engine room and that can become very dangerous and i think that's true the board dropping down and then the executive dropping down and i think there's two things hey you've got to make sure you've got the team underneath you and i think again pushing that development is, is vitally important because again, the leaders are going to have less time and you can start seeing things around you, don't you? You know, you walk into your supermarket at the moment, there's nothing on the shelf. And so you're beginning to get customers not being able to get what they want at a time when actually that's not good because the customer starts looking elsewhere. So I think that element of the DNA of, of um, 
competency and skill, and that comes back to management strength in order that the leaders can perform, I think is vitally important. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you, Matthew. I will close it there. Thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast on high impact leadership. Look forward to speaking to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sally.